Hello and welcome to the Scottish Football Show. As the nation collectively tries to pull itself out of a lint ball in just coma, there's no let up in the football in just mayhem. It's still absolutely freezing outside, but the relegation battle is heating up nicely in the top flight, and the race for the championship title is on fire. And there's even more football to come, including the big one. That's right, the Concarden Derby. Hello, yes, I am football filmmaker Finlay Marks, sitting in the hot seat once again this week. And joining me on the show today from Sky Sports News is Andrew Dixon. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Merry Christmas. Uh, I've just spent a week producing the sport on Sky News and I've had news presenters and sport presenters fawning over each other saying, Merry Christmas, is it still okay to say Merry Christmas? So I'm going to say... Merry Christmas, and I hope everybody had a good one. Merry Christmas to you too, mate. Did you get up to much over Christmas? Were you uh, in London or back in uh, the motherland for it? Back in the motherland, yeah, it's been really good. I actually got along to a bit of football as well, which was was good fun. It's good to be home, even if it's uh, it's not quite as nice weather-wise as I would like it to be. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I think I, I would appreciate a little bit of sleet or drizzle at the moment. Slightly warm over uh, Melbourne Way. I think it was the day before yesterday, it was 38 degrees. So that was that was very much a day indoors <laughs> <laughs> for me. Yeah. In the news this week, national team captain Andy Robertson made history this week, becoming the EPL's undisputed assist king, for defenders at least. On Boxing Day, he notched his 54th assist against Aston Villa, overtaking Leighton Baines in the process. This is amazing to have such a prominent Scottish footballer doing bits in the EPL still. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, this one kind of took me a little bit by surprise. I didn't expect that this was something that was coming up. It's obviously a terrific statistic for for Andy Robertson. I mean, obviously there was uh, a lot made two or three seasons back when Liverpool won the Premier League of the assists that both him and Trent Alexander-Arnold had. And I think they were just more or less even with each other. So for Robertson to be outright ahead of any other defender in the in the Premier League is is pretty impressive because... You know, that's a competition that's been going for 30 plus years now. And uh, for him to be top of the pile in that respect, I'm, I actually, I'm, I'm slightly surprised that the number is what it is. 54 assists feels like it should be a bit higher given how long that competition has been going along. But nevertheless, um, a, a great statistic for him and certainly shows his worth for, for Liverpool as well. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a nice little accolade for him to have. I did point out that it's, it's, so it's four defenders. I think the all-time the all time assist king in the, the, the EPL is Ryan Giggs, who is 162, I think it is. So he's still a little bit shy of that, but it's, it's, it's great. I, uh, it's a shame that Laura's not on this week because Andy Robertson is her absolute favourite and any opportunity to talk about him, she will gladly take. Just staying in English football briefly, did you see him? It's one of my favourite things of the year. Sean Rooney, former St. Johnson player, Sean Rooney getting sent off for Fleetwood Town and then trying to fight every single person on the way off the pitch. Extraordinary. Yeah, if you're going to go, I mean, you might as well take the Sean Rooney route. I mean, it, it seemed at first when he was going off the park, he was going to do it with a bit of dignity. And then <laughs> as he got closer to the touchline, it was very clear that there were one or two people they had in his vision and uh, and, he, and he certainly went for them as well. So, you know, fair play. <laughs> it just gets stuck right in there. If you're going to get a ban, you might as well make it a good one. Uh, I, I guess maybe he's got family plans in the new year or something like that. Steak pie at his mum's house or something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, just making sure he's definitely going to be there for it. It, just, it was quite interesting to see, you know, almost a full-blown scrap between both sides and Scott Brown not wanting to be involved at all. He was just very... Resolute on the touchline, watching it all happen in front of him. Yeah, a, a bit of a, a, a far cry from uh, from Scott Brown, the Celtic captain, with the shaven head and and getting involved and everything. You know, he's got a full head of hair again, and you know, <laughs> you and I, you and I are fellow baldies, so we can only look <laughs> on with admiration at the full head of hair he has. But um, maybe that's bringing a more calm attitude from him as well, because he wasn't getting quite in the mix in the week he might have done as a player. Unorthodox one two takes it back. Sibold that does it for United in the deepest of injury time. The midfielder caresses one home 
three goals, three points. A good night to be a United fan. As we come into the final days of 2022 and we're all existing in that weird glazed over hinterland between Christmas and New Year where nobody's really sure what day it even is, thankfully there has been no let up in the action on the pitch. A true festive feast of football. Let's begin, Andrew, at Tannadice, where on Wednesday, Dundee United climbed off the foot of the table and in the process swapped places with Ross County after they defeated them 3-0. A Connor Randall own goal and a Craig Sibold strike happened either side of a quite delicious goal from Charlie Mulgrew, who was making his first appearance for the Tangerines since September. I love a diving header. There aren't nearly enough of them. Yeah, big fan as well. I, in my days when I was kidding myself on that I could play football, playing 11s for like my boys brigade team and stuff like that when I was uh, <laughs> a teenager and what have you I was a kind of centre half and played kind of left back as well and I loved a good tackle so anything <laughs> kind of remotely defensive and I include a kind of diving header in that as well because it's the kind of thing that you um, you, you, you do as a, a defender any kind of defender doing defender type things <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm quite fond of so yeah great header for, from Mulgrew good result for United as well to be honest because it just hasn't really got going for them I know they obviously got a little bit of a lift after the change of manager but they are still down there and but for that result against Ross County they were bottom before it so United will, will clearly hope to build on it and take that result uh, as some kind of platform into the new year. Well, that's four points for Dundee United from their first two games back after the break which is exactly the kind of way that they would have wanted to hit the ground running coming back from what had been a fairly disastrous uh, season up until that point really for Ross County Malky Mackay after the game talked about the fine margins and reflected on the fact that although it was a 3-0 scoreline that the margins were actually much closer than, than the scoreline would suggest it just really wasn't Ross County's night at all I mean a calamitous own goal from Conor Rando. they hit the woodwork they were denied a penalty potentially from a handball by Charlie Mulgrew Akio had the goal ruled out for offside when it was still 2-1 and then there's the Edwards red card as well it just wasn't a very good night at all but in his comments after the game Al Mackay had said they just need to keep working and doing what they're doing and he's convinced that they'll be able to start picking up the points that they need he admitted that they're in a relegation battle but he said he felt that Ross County were as good, if not better, than a couple of the sides round about them. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Things at the wrong end of the table are really starting to get interesting now as Kilmarnock defeated Aberdeen at Rugby Park for the first time since 2012 and moved above Motherwell into nine. So just four points separate the bottom four sides in the division. It's really starting to get quite tasty. In this game, Andrew... Aberdeen hadn't lost away at Killy since 2012. I find that absolutely incredible. I mean, it's not a surprise that they lost the game. But some of the, the defending by Aberdeen in this match was just absolutely suicidal. Yeah, I mean, the Aberdeen fans are understandably a bit miffed about what's happening in their team at the moment. I saw a statistic, I think it was before this game against Kilmarnock, uh, maybe after the, the game against Rangers last week. I think Jim Goodwin had had the same number of games in charge as Stephen Glass. Yeah. But had taken four points more. And, and yeah. generally speaking, the record was pretty similar to Stephen Glass's in terms of wins, draws, defeats, goal scored, goals against. And that comes against a backdrop at the moment of a poor run for Aberdeen since yeah. the, the, the resumption of the, the campaign. Things are not going their way. Aberdeen fans, understandably, are asking questions about the manager. And, you know, if you were a betting man and you were saying who who might be next to find themselves under a bit of pressure from their, their board of directors, you would think that Jim Goodwin wouldn't be necessarily that far away. And a, a much-needed result for Kilmarnock, given, again, how tight it is at the bottom. That just lifts them up a little bit. will give them a bit of confidence. And I, I'm sure for Derek McInnes as well, there'll be a, a little bit of satisfaction at, at taking a result against his old team. Absolutely. It was an amazing uh, consolation goal from Matty Kennedy, his, his second goal in two games. But that's all it was in the end. I always find it such a shame when a team loses a match but there's, they score a brilliant goal and th those goals just kind of get lost in the ether because fans don't want to really revisit defeats and things like that but as you say that's that's Aberdeen's fourth straight 
league defeat in a row. We were talking about it a little bit on the podcast last week with John Bleasdale, who's a, an Aberdeen fan, contrasting the Stephen Glass tenure to Jim Goodwin's tenure. There's not a huge amount of difference in it points-wise. But I think just the way that they feel that they're playing, not in the most recent matches, but certainly for most of this season and their home form, feels like it's it's a, a bit of a sea change from last year in terms of the attacking intent that the team have. But also the fact that they're in the, the League Cup semi-final, I think helps as well. And, and that's been a bit more of a salve to Aberdeen fans. But I think you're right, if, if it keeps going, that's four straight defeats in a row, it could be a little bit of pressure rising on Jim Goodwin. Aberdeen still remain fourth in the table and at that end of the of the division, the race for the top six is, is shaping up rather nicely. Livy and St Mirren shared the spoils. Both teams went into the match with the potential of going third. I, I mean, it's been an amazing first half of the season for both of these clubs. It, is it a little bit unexpected? Maybe potentially more from St Mirren than Livy. Li, you know, Livy under David Martindale have looked really well organised now for the best part of two and a half years. But with St Mirren, is it a bit of a surprise to see them pushing so far up the table? I don't know if it is, to be honest, because things are so tight in the league. I mean, I'm, just, I'm looking at the table in front of me here and you've got Aberdeen in fourth place at the moment, 25 points. And, and granted, you know, there's there's a bit of a disparity in terms of games in hand and what have you, but Aberdeen yeah. fourth and 25 points. And then you go down to Kilmarnock in ninth, 19 points. So it's only two wins behind, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's certainly very tight. And I think, you know, Stephen Robinson at, at Motherwell did very well a very decent job uh, with the kind of limited budget they had there so I don't know if that does come as a massive surprise that going to a club like St Mirren where the budget is relatively similar and the expectations are probably relatively similar as well where if you break into the top six that's been a, a fairly decent season if you have quite a good cup run that's been that's been quite good fans probably aren't looking for too much more than that I know we spoke on the podcast a few weeks back about the decision that St Mirren had taken to not sell to, to Celtic and to Rangers fans yeah. and the kind of extra stand and, you know, the upturn in, in attendance that, that they'd had off the back of that in terms of home fans coming to games. If you've got that and you've got more supporters showing a bit of belief in the club and in the team by turning up and coming through the gate, that might just transfer itself to an extent into the team itself and... Livingston have uh, have shown themselves to be very awkward opponents. Both of these teams have shown themselves to be fairly solid and when you look at how clustered that kind of middle third of the table is, if they can get a win or two against the other teams around them, it, it can do a lot to propel them up the table a bit. So I, I actually don't think it's an enormous surprise that they are where they are. Lauren Shanklin's prolific season in front of goal continued. He scored the opening goal in Hearts 3-2 win away in Perth against St Johnston. We were just talking about Kelly's record at home to Aberdeen, but this was Hart's first win at McDermott Park since 2010. 12 years since they last beat St. Johnson on their own ground. Lauren Shanklin just continues to be a, a, a real revelation. He's been a terrific signing for Hearts this season. He was actually wearing the captain's armband against uh, St. Johnson and, and playing in a, a a slightly deeper role as well. And just his, his movement, the, he's such a clever player, the way that he's able to draw other players into the game, pull defenders away slightly. It created all sorts of problems for St. Johnson. 13 goals and two assists in his 18 league games so far. He's, he's been a tremendous acquisition for Hearts. Yeah, he's done very well. I mean, obviously there, there are penalties in, in that number as well, but he has done very well. You wonder to an extent what the spell in Belgian football did for him yeah. uh, last season. And what I said earlier about Hearts, the fact that the don't have these European games now. I mean, obviously, uh, they were in quite a difficult group to get out of with, with Istanbul and yeah. Fiorentina in there. Uh, they were always going to do well to get anything better than probably third ahead of uh, of the Latvians that they played. You know, despite that and despite the inconsistency that can come with playing European football and then domestic football, midweek, weekend, midweek, weekend, they are, you know, they're ticking along quite nicely and, and Shanklin certainly has come into that team and, and contributed very well indeed. A good time too, you know, because Hearts, uh, we touched on it in previous podcasts, that they did have a lot of injury problems. So, you know, if you've got somebody who is still popping up and scoring a few goals and keeping the, the results 
on the the kind of the right side of the line, if you like. Uh, another really important contribution from him at McDermott Park, and uh, a very good result for Hearts. I, I was surprised too by that that statistic about it being the first win there in twelve years. I mean, clearly not the easiest of places to go to, but. When you look at, um, I mean, the likes of Celtic particularly have had such a dominant record in their games against St. Johnson. Rangers generally, I know they lost there quite recently, but generally have done pretty well too. So, you know, to have the kind of record that Hearts have had is, is kind of slightly surprising, to be honest. There were a couple of um, mildly contentious penalty decisions uh, that Willie Collum ended up awarding quite a few of them through VAR as well. Dreadful penalty from Carey, which ended up costing St. Johnson a point in the end. An absolute beauty from Barry Mackay, though, his first goal since August. Xander Clark made his first start in that game for Hearts at McDermott Park, of course, the the place where he'd uh, plied his trade for so much of the last number of years. Of course, he was starting between the sticks in place of the injured Craig Gordon, who suffered an absolutely horrific double leg break against Dundee United in the Christmas Eve fixture. Obviously, it's a tragic thing to happen to not just a player like Craig Gordon, who's been such a had such an amazing career, but just at this stage of his career as well. I mean, this is the third serious injury that he's had in his his very lengthy career, and he turns forty uh, tomorrow. Uh, in fact, the thirty first of December. But um, Robbie Nielsen isn't ruling him out. Um, making a return to Hearts at, at some point he said uh, after that game against Dundee United the 2-2 draw I've known Craig for a long long time and he's a warrior he's faced injury adversity before and come back stronger so I've no doubt that he'll approach this in the same manner he's had such an incredible career overall but the the, the last number of years since he's moved back to Tynecastle, he's been absolutely phenomenal you working his way back into contention, not just at the national team, but definitively Scotland's number one goalkeeper. So this is as much a problem for, for the whole country as as it is for Hearts fans. Yeah, it poses a massive problem for Steve Clark now because there's no obvious replacement for, for Craig Gordon. David Marshall is, is not involved anymore. Alan McGregor has not been involved for quite some time and, and Rangers fans will certainly... Uh, make the argument that his best days are, are behind him now as well. So then you look at who's who's kind of next in line. John McLaughlin is a, a kind of a regular in the squad, but isn't really playing at Rangers. Robbie McCrory falls into the same category. Uh, and you, you touched on Xander Clark. I think this is a massive opportunity for Xander Clark, actually, uh, not just to establish himself at Hearts, which clearly he's got the chance to do that for the rest of the season, but um, he's got a couple of months now before Scotland play again in which to show that he can make himself a fixture at, at Hearts, but also play his way into the reckoning with, with Scotland because that position is, is suddenly very wide open. I think another name that's got to be in the mix there as well is, is mother was Liam Kelly who I think has been a tremendously consistent goalkeeper. I, I, I think on balance over the last couple of seasons, I would suggest that Liam Kelly is, is a slightly better goalkeeper all round than Xander Clark. I think when Xander Clark has a good day, he, he has very good days. But I think in terms of consistency, Liam Kelly might might be the slightly better option. But it does feed into something that does slightly frustrate me about Steve Clark a little, which is that, you know, the game against... Turkey the friendly just before the World Cup so he played Craig Gordon in that match to me I I don't get not using those kind of opportunities where there is nothing at stake in the game to not allow that as as a the kind of match where he could have given a start or at least 45 minutes to to Liam Kelly or or Xander Clark or any other Scottish goalkeeper that's that's in the squad I don't necessarily know if it's as big an issue, particularly for a goalkeeper, if they're not playing every single game. You do get instances of players who aren't performing often for their club side, but can still turn it on at international level. I remember Alan Hutton for years, the blue cafu. He uh, he was kind of frozen out at Aston Villa for a long time and yet still was called up and did the business for Scotland from right back. So it's an interesting conundrum. I, 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 I mean, it's just it's so desperately disappointing to lose a player, not just of the the ability of Craig Gordon, but the stature. Because I think when you've got those types of players, it's not just the 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 attributes that they can bring in the position that they play, the skill set that they have. It's it's the aura that they have, the experience like that is something that is just vital to 
teammates, especially younger teammates. So yeah, we wish Craig all the very best in their recovery. Aside from the dreadful Gordon injury, I mean, it was a fantastic match between Dundee United and Hearts. The Jambo City rivals Hibs, however, lost on Wednesday at home to Celtic by four goals to nil. The inverse of the scoreline from their, their Christmas Eve fixture against Livy. There were a couple of interesting pre-match comments made by Lee Johnson just for a change in this one, Andrew. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not entirely sure what Lee Johnson thinks he's going to achieve with some of the things that he says. I don't know if he's trying to be a guy that comes out with a snappy soundbite from time to time or if he is just a little bit naive or, uh, or a bit too honest for his own good. Uh, obviously, the latest one was he was talking about how good Celtic are. And, you know, I mean, there's been two or three different things that he, that he said that it, within that sequence, he's kind of likened them to basically being uh, right up there with the, the Premier League's best and uh, only Manchester City are a better team in terms of the, the, the sides that he's come up against. On top of that as well, he likened trying to overtake Celtic being a bit like driving a Fiat Punto and trying to get past a Ferrari, which, <laughs> you know, is quite amusing and all the rest of it. If I was a Hibs fan, I don't know if I'd be massively amused by that at all. In fact, you know, it, it feels quite defeatist. It feels like you're going into the game beaten already before you've even you know, got out of the dressing room and got up the tunnel and onto the pitch. And managers have, and you know, and captains and, and, and people who contribute to team talks before games they have a responsibility to G players up and all the rest of it. And it, it kind of doesn't really matter what is said in the dressing room before a game. Yeah. If that kind of thing is said to the press and it appears in the papers on the day of the match, it sends out the wrong message for me entirely. You know, it, it may well be that Lee Johnson believes exactly what he said about the Fiat Punto and the Ferrari thing. Does he need to say it? Mm, I'm not sure he does. Yeah. And I, I, it really sends out the wrong message to a lot of supporters. And I can understand why... One or two people are, have been a bit put out by by his comments there. Whether it did embed this thing subconsciously about, yeah, they're miles better than us and, and Celtic then go on to win 4-0 at, at Easter Road. You know, I'm not sure if, if his comments played a part or not. I certainly don't think it will have helped his players in any way, that's for sure. Well, I mean, Hibs did actually make a really good start in that game. Ange Postacoglu mentioned it in his post-match comments about how well Hibs had started and how Celtic had to weather the storm, and it did feel like it was a bit a bit of a continuation from their from their match on Christmas Eve because they were they were great against Livy. It would be remiss not to mention Davy Marshall saving not one but two penalties in that match as well was man of the match, obviously keeping a clean sheet as well. The football scores app FOTMOB, which I'm a, quite a keen user of, handed out only their fourth ever ten out of ten performance. It's not quite what's what's the French publication that pride themselves and oh, the key, yeah, yeah. Of, of handing it ten out of ten performances. So not quite as celebrious as that, but um, it's still impressive nonetheless. Away from the top flight, the Christmas Eve fixtures also saw some pretty terrific matches uh, across the other divisions in the Championship. Dundee moved top of the table after an impressive two 0 away win at Air United despite having 10 men for much of that match. In the Battle of the Thistles, Partick's terrific form of late saw them thrash a barely held together Inverness Cali Thistle 5-1 at For Hill. The Mary Hill side are now themselves just four points behind leaders Dundee, the championship for a division. Thumping wins for FC Edinburgh and Falkirk kept up the pressure on League One leaders Dunfermline and Stirling Albion kept up their superb recent form to win away at Elgin City and they sit just four points behind Dumbarton who lead the way in League Two. And Stevie May! Bedlam! Chaos! Euphoria in the away stands! Blue limbs everywhere! Looking ahead to the fixtures coming our way this week, all eyes will be on Ibrox at midday on the 2nd of January as Rangers host runaway league leaders Celtic. Both sides warmed up for the almost New Year's Day clash with 3-0 and 4-0 wins respectively on Wednesday. It was mostly a tale of two players returning from the World Cup, Borna Barisic crafting a beautiful opener for Rangers against Motherwell on their way to victory and Aaron Moyes' first goals for Celtic helped them blow Hibs away in what was yet another relentless performance. Just looking ahead to this game, Andrew, is it slightly too dramatic to suggest that anything other than a Rangers win here will 
effectively hand the title to Celtic? Uh, I mean, certainly I think a Celtic win would more or less hand the title to Celtic because then they go 12 points clear uh, and that is going to be extremely difficult to, to claw back. If Rangers don't lose and it stays at nine, probably still pretty tough, to be honest. If they can bring it back to six, then yeah, they might make a fist of it. I've got to be honest, been at a couple of the, the games since Michael Beale took charge and Rangers have looked okay in spells. Um, he's made some changes that have made a bit of a difference. But Celtic are so settled at the moment and so consistent with their level of performance. They have the bit between their teeth at the moment. And I think if you look at this game on, on Monday, Celtic, for me, are the favourites to, to win uh, Ibrox by quite a bit. Rangers have clearly shown character. They came from 2-1 down against Hibs to win 3-2. They did the same against Aberdeen. They, they ground it out up at Ross County and were pretty comfortable against Motherwell in midweek, uh, winning 3-0. At the end of the day, this is a results business. So if you can grind out the results, no matter how you get them, uh, that's the most important thing. And, uh, and Rangers have clearly shown that they can apply themselves in a way where they do get a positive result. But it's a different challenge entirely against a Celtic team, which right. uh, at the moment is is really trundling along very well indeed. What, 12 wins in a row is it now? At the same time, we've seen so many old firm games in the past where there's been an overwhelming favourite and it's been the other team that's won. And it wouldn't be just the nature of this fixture. It wouldn't be massively surprising if that kind of thing happened again because it's definitely not out with the realms of possibility that the that, that Rangers could get a result here. But they are going to have to have a very good day. They're going to have to be tighter in defence because defensively they have looked quite shaky. Uh, and they're going to have to hope that Celtic turn up at Ibrox and be a little bit complacent or have an off day. And if all those things happen, then Rangers clearly have an opportunity. If Celtic turn up and they're on their game, I would expect Celtic will win. It is formidable for them that Celtic are coming into this game. They've won their last 12 matches in the league in a row. It is formidable for them that Celtic come in. I think you're right. They probably have to come in as favourites. Tactically, one of the more interesting things that I've noticed under Michael Beale in, in his first couple of games in charge is, is the way that he's kind of redeployed Ryan Kent who in previous Old Firm matches has been such a thorn in Celtic's side. And he might potentially be one of the keys to unlocking that Celtic back line. I saw a tweet during the week, which was um, Joshua Barry from the Rangers Review, who we've had on the show before. And he was comparing not heat maps, but they were kind of like um, maps detailing the passes made to Ryan Kent during Van Bronckhorst's uh, last three matches and Beale's first three matches. And it's, it's night and day, everything from the Van Brockhorst games is, is almost sellotaped to the left-hand side of, the, of, of the, the picture. It's all coming down the left-hand side. All the balls are coming over to the left. If you look at it under Michael Beale, it's much more scattergun. Ken is still picking up the biggest majority of his passes on the left-hand side of the pitch, as you would expect, as the left-sided forward. But he is picking it up in defence. He's picking it up in midfield. He's making moves to the right. He's collecting balls as runs into the box. So do you think that that is potentially one of the keys to Rangers giving themselves the biggest chance going into this game to try and get a result against Celtic? Yeah, I think it's it's important for Rangers to have Ryan Kent involved in this game because if Celtic nullify his threat, I would argue that Rangers stand very little chance of getting any kind of positive result. Yeah. Um, Ken, for me, since Beal has come in, has been the standout player by quite a distance in the Rangers team. Just looking ahead to some of the other fixtures as well, of course, we've got the Edinburgh Derby. Surely Hearts would have to be favourites for this one. I mean, the Hibs, who knows what we're going to get from Hibs. Yeah, I would think so. They are just starting to see things fall out of place for them a little bit. And as we touched on earlier, Hibs are just so erratic in their performances and their results that um, the prospect of, of going to Hearts and, and getting a positive result, some kind of uh, a, a draw or possibly even a win. Again, it's not impossible, but Hearts, you know, having had the, the, the issue with Craig Gordon and losing him to injury in their last home game and, and you know, they've addressed that. And in, in the first match after he came out of the team, they, they've managed to get a win uh, at a tricky venue where they've not won for so long. That will give them confidence and in, in going into a home match against their biggest rivals, yeah, absolutely. You would expect that the that, that Hearts are the favourites and I, I think probably Hearts will edge it as well. There's a couple of really interesting fixtures across the rest of the, the Premiership as well. Uh, Aberdeen hosting Ross County, two sides in, in desperate need of, of wins for uh, for slightly different reasons at different ends of the table. 
Killeo hosting St Mirren, which I think could be a really interesting match. Motherwell travel to Livingston and we've also got the Tayside Derby, which is always tasty, St Johnson versus Dundee United. Having a look down into the Championship, league leaders Dundee host Arbroath, who are not bot- quite bottom of the table but are not having a great season. There's another Glasgow Derby as Queen's Park play Partick Thistle. And then in League One, the standout match there is the Concarden Derby, Dunfermline at home to Falkirk. Dunfermline going very, very well in, in League One and clearly... As are Falkirk, I've got to say, a bigger club than than, than League One with, without being disrespectful to the other teams in that division. Huge game. There'll be a big crowd at it as well. Uh, I think the, the attendances at Dunfermline have been going up and up and up this season. I wouldn't be surprised if it's not that far off five figures. I don't know if it'll quite get there, but uh, I think that's a, a reflection of just the, the level of interest in, in Dunfermline, certainly at the moment. Um, and with the form that they've been in, you would expect that they will come out on top and over the course of time, we'll see them going back into the championship. Uh, the Queen's Park game against Thistle that you mentioned as well, I mean, it's taking place at Oakville View. They're almost back at, at Lesser Hamden or, 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 or sorry, into Lesser Hamden, if you like, obviously. Uh, the, the home games were at, were at Hamden previously. Um, I, I went past Lesser Hamden when I'm up in Glasgow. I'm, I'm from Kiscart, which is, is just along the road. And uh, the place has taken shape and it, it looks like it will be I mean obviously I think the talk is that it's going to be ready in the coming weeks and uh, it looks as though it will be a good home for, for Queen's Park um, I'm looking forward to getting along to a game there and, and, and seeing how they get on clearly the, the move into professional football has been a good one for them so far and they've, they've come up a couple of divisions in, in recent seasons and are now knocking on the door to get up into the Premiership. It'd be quite the story if they got there. They're doing a lot of things right and against a Thistle team, which, as you said, won so convincingly against Inverness. That's one which uh, I certainly think will be very interesting indeed. So uh, another exciting set of matches ahead. I'm looking forward very much to, to seeing how they go because there are some uh, very, very interesting ties in prospect. Regret, it's not, it's good laugh, isn't it? So. I didn't find it funny. Now, as the year draws to a close, it's always fun to look back over the year that was, and there is no one better place to do that than Adam Miller, aka Old Firm Facts on Twitter, the man who's made a career out of writing and joking about the consistently weird and wonderful world of Scottish football. Adam, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks very much for having me on. How did you feel that 2022 was compared to previous years in Scottish football? Do you feel that there were some standout moments or, or has it kind of been sadly lacking in the kind of banter and mentalness that's usually there? <laughs> I think I, I, I've got a kind of skewed way of looking at football now. Like, I don't think I can appreciate football in its own terms. I'm always like, well, what's what's the joke or what's the weird angle or whatever? But um, I think there's been plenty this year. Looking back, because I've been doing a couple of kind of roundup things over the last couple of weeks, you're always thinking, I can't really remember much of it. And then you're going through it and you're like, actually, how do I condense this down? <laughs> That's always the issue is there's too much yeah. stuff going on. So there's things you forget about, like months and months ago, the guy, uh, Tim McAnola, that signed for Dundee United and thought he was signing for Dundee. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, I, think it's been a, I think it's been a good year. I mean, for me... I think the biggest contributor to that's probably been Mark McGee is a uh, resurgence for about three, four months, maybe. I mean, it kind of felt like Mark McGee was his own kind of like weird headline generating machine when he took over. The fact that he had, was that a six match touchline ban before he was even allowed to take take control? But what what particularly were some of the things around Mark McGee that, that kind of made you laugh? There were, there were a few. There was, um, <laughs> the, the, there was the St. Johnston game they had. It was a... Uh, it was maybe around April and there were about three different motivational techniques that he applied in the build up to this game. One of them was, if we win, I'll go naked. And to, you know, to my mind, I would have thought that the motivational technique would be, if we win, I won't go naked. Um, <laughs> but there was, there was, he said, he said that, he said, I'm switching the heating off and I'm going to not fast, but not eat very much in the build up to the game. And the idea was that he was going to literally be hungry for success. <laughs> and I don't even, I can't even remember what the reason behind turning off the heating was. Maybe just kind of cost a living crisis affecting Mark McGee. But I, I, I don't know what the logic was there. And eventually it was, I think, one all maybe. They, they did win it anyway. 
Um, he was a law unto himself. He, even the ceremony when he was unveiled, if you can call it a ceremony, just looked kind of bleak. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it looked like he was in an old folks' home or something like that. <laughs> it's like, surely there's... Just get him out on the pit. Like, yeah. what, why are you putting him in this room? You obviously um, work not just... Uh, you're well known for Twitter, but you, you do a lot of writing articles and things like that as well. Mm. Are there any particular headlines that were standout ones for you from either the national or the regional newspapers, which are always kind of good value for, for this kind of thing? Uh, I mean, there's there's been a few. On McGee, there was one. Mark McGee revisits radiator decision as Dundee boss admits there's no link to football. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. There was also, I can't remember, I think this was from the record. Uh, Scott's granddad fighting Russians in Ukraine is notorious Hibs football casual. Uh, that was one of my absolute favourites from this year as well. I think, it, it, I mean, the headline's fantastic, but it was the, um, it's the kind of like the sub headlines underneath it. While in Ukraine on Saturday, Rab asked friends on social media, what's the Hibs score? A pal wrote <laughs> back, get on with killing Russians for f sake. <laughs> <laughs> and then another one of his pals said, not kicked off, mate. <laughs> It was, there was a lot of good stuff this year. You personally actually kind of recently incurred the ire of um, <laughs> of some Celtic fan websites because of an article you wrote about Lionel Messi. Um, can you just tell us a bit about what happened there? Oh my God, man. Um, <laughs> again, with these things, there's no, there's no re great amount of thought goes into it. So I did this two and a half years ago, or just over two years ago, when Messi was still at Barcelona and getting linked with a move away. Yeah. And I did, for Glasgow Live, I did the story and it was something like former Rangers target Lionel Messi set for Barcelona exit as Alfredo Morelos' future hangs in the air or something like that. <laughs> and all those things in the headline were accurate. None yes. of them, yeah. none of those things were lies. Messi had been targeted by Alec McLeish. Morelos' future was in doubt. Yeah. And Messi was going to be leaving Barcelona. Whether they all belonged in the same headline is a matter of debate. But <laughs> I, you know, I did that at the time and it had a really, really good reaction. And you had a sort of pocket of angry dads on the internet reading the headline and not getting the context. Yeah. But I can absolutely live with it. And that's, that's kind of part of the fun of it for me. It's not the yeah. main reason you do it, but it's part of the fun. And so when it was, I think it was like late on in the second half of the final, the World Cup final, I thought I could probably do that again. And I went for it. It had the reaction I was hoping for. And all I'll say is the tweet was doing really well. And there was a slip backlash from some kind of middle-aged Celtic fans, but they represented maybe like 5% of the people responding to it. The vast majority of responses were positive. Yeah. Yeah. But while the story still exists, the headline is different and the tweet has been deleted. And all I'll say is that was not necessarily my choice. Okay, fair enough. It's a great example of how easily offended maybe isn't necessarily the right word, but certainly um, the, the the reaction to that is a bit over the top, you know I mean? It's like mm -hmm. a bit of a sense of humour bypass from quite a few people. It's very clear you're having a bit of a laugh with and a bit of a joke. Obviously, from your point of view, you know, you, you cast the fishing rod out there and you caught a big one from, uh, from quite a <laughs> lot of people. Quite a good example, I think, of people maybe just getting a little bit hit up about something that they didn't need to be that offended by. I, I thought the main problem was more that it was this kind of lack of, it's probably a less wanky way of putting it, but it's a kind of lack of digital literacy of yeah. just not, of just jumping in two footed before yeah. you step back and going, actually, what's the context here? You know, the joke was a hundred percent about the media, about mm. the Scottish media. Yeah. If you read the article, it's just basically a satire and like, I hate describing what I do as satire, even though like I, I love satire. It's just, you can't, you can't not sound wanky when you talk about yourself and use the word satire. But I, 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 it, to me, every word of it was basically based on the kind of thing you might read just slightly elevated, slightly exaggerated, but the kind of thing you might read, you see constantly Celtic and Rangers crowbarred into Scottish tabloid headlines yeah particularly there was an example i'm sure i talked about in my podcast a while ago where it was it was a news story a front page news story and they'd played hundreds of games for other clubs but they'd maybe had four games on trial for celtic yeah and he was referred to as like former celtic star you know and there's so, so much of that and that's basically what the article was about for you if people actually read it but they saw this thing and because 
they're so primed to hate everything that the Scottish media do. They're like, they've actually said this. They they actually they're framing it as like a former Rangers target. Of course, of course, it's a piss take. You know. Yeah. On on a slightly wider point, I just kind of wanted to ask you about what you feel the role of you know kind of comedy and poking fun at things in Scottish football is because. It's something, I, I don't know if you would agree, but I, I've kind of felt that over the last like 10 years or so, I think maybe as Andrew was saying, it's kind of reflected a bit more of a, a fractious relationship between partisan groups in, in society, culturally, <laughs> where like you're saying, people get very defensive straight away and there's like an almost like a, a, a complete blindness to a sense of humour when it comes to specific things that they feel very passionately about. And I think that's to our detriment as as a collective of like Scottish football fans and as a community, I guess, in, in, in a weirdly loose term, because it's one of the things that I remember being so powerful in the best possible way, looking at things like Only an Excuse growing up, which constantly mocked, you know, the rivalries and the bigotry and all the, the weird parochial things that, you know, we love about Scottish football, but that can just tip over the edge sometimes into something that's that's maybe a bit of a mountain out of a molehill. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I grew up with only an excuse and even off the ball as well. And I, I loved that. I, that was really influential for me is that, you know, I'm not, I'm not consciously when I'm doing jokes or columns trying to go, well, what would Jonathan Watson have done or what would Jason yeah. Tam have done? But it's part of, it seep, seeps in from years of listening and watching growing up. And I think with the, even out with football, Scotland has such a rich history when it comes to comedy. And so it's strange that, you know, we can produce all these world-class comedians, but we're so incapable of laughing about our own football teams. <laughs> you know, even before Old Firm Facts existed. I've grown up around Celtic fans and Rangers fans, and I'd be making jokes about football in the pub, just the same as my mates would be doing. Yeah. And we can all take a joke. And so it... It, it stunned me when Old Firm Facts started to take, take off a wee bit how incapable some people were of being able to laugh about their own team. And so it, it just, to me, it should be something that, I know it's, our football clubs are kind of fundamental to our identity and who we are and all the rest of it, but you should still be able to take a step back and not lose the rag when someone makes a joke about your football team. You know, I don't know if it's just in my head, but I feel like over the last couple of years, people have got more hit up about it. People yeah. have got more, there, there's, if someone doesn't like something you do, the backlash is greater oh. and it's more vitriolic. And I, I don't know if this is something to do with maybe just how people have been feeling with the pandemic and with cost of living prices and all the rest, but people kind of, cooked up at home and just getting more and more frustrated and it's yeah. spilling out in these ways but I've definitely found I've maybe done kind of in my head fairly innocuous jokes that were maybe similar to things that put out a couple of years ago yeah. that had no issue people had no issue with and it's not in terms of it's not touching on anything offensive it's just joking about a certain football team and suddenly there's a big backlash this time around and yeah. I don't know if it's just people are angrier or or what's going on, but I've definitely noticed it. It could, as much as anything, it could be down to just the rise of social media. Over the course of time, people have found that they've got a voice a bit more than they had before, and it's given mm-hmm. them confidence to to express their feelings. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily in terms of having that ability to, to put across what you think about things, but clearly some people don't necessarily have a filter. People are maybe a little bit too hasty with with how they put things across. And, you know, as as someone who's a journalist myself, social media allows everyone to be a journalist as much as they want to be. Mm -hmm. If it happens to be that at the same time that person can't really take a joke and therefore puts their feelings across in a way that is perhaps not the way they should be put across, um, I can understand, I suppose, to an extent why that would happen. I think that one of the stranger things, I mean, I've never been, again, prior to from Facts, I've never been someone who's sort of sought out confrontation or anything like that, you know, getting to the odd argument down the pub or whatever, but you never, you were never actually seeking to piss people off. Yeah. And I didn't, mm. didn't ever really seek to do that with old from Facts either. It was just something to kind of make people laugh. And it did take me aback and took me a bit of getting used to was how pissed off people would get and how defensive they'd get. But I I think, like, you, yeah, I get plenty of people who will tell me, oh, I off your dick and that stuff <laughs> never has an impact but you get people who and i feel like a lot of the time it's projection they've built up a whole idea of who you are or what yeah. you stand for yeah. and it'll be 
if you if they if I'll tweet a joke or a column that they don't like, then it it, is, it factors into this picture that they have of me as like part of the MSM, and I've done this <laughs> to get into the media, or I've done. Yeah. And you read things about yourself that are completely untrue, and you know that there's people who get it a million times worse than I do on Twitter. But it's very weird to read people say definitively he's saying this because he supports Celtic. He's saying this because he supports Rangers. As as one guy I used to be convinced, he's saying this because he supports Hibs. You know, like, like this, <laughs> it, it's really strange to read that kind of thing about you when there's just no basis for it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's one thing I can certainly relate to what you're saying there because <laughs> I think anybody who knows anything about me knows my background is is from kind of a Rangers angle, and I've mm. worked for, for Rangers for for a few years, and I find myself in a position where people make assumptions about me that I must be this and I must be that and I must be a bit bigoted or I must be, you know, whatever. And, okay. you know, the, the reality is quite different. You know, I mean, I'm a pretty normal person in the same way that you are as well, in the same way that so many people who express their feelings and their opinions across social media with re regards to Scottish football. The vast majority are pretty normal people. <laughs> By and large, you know, people are not necessarily the stereotype that, that, that some perhaps project them to be. Particularly, I think probably in your situation where you are trying to make jokes about things and trying to add a bit of humour in, um, you know, on the face of it, that should be a good thing. That should be a positive thing. But mm -hmm. I suppose you probably find yourself that that, that kind of leaves you open to a bit of misinterpretation like you're talking about there. Yeah, yeah, that that definitely happens. I, I don't know like, how you find it in, you know, now that you're not specifically working for Rangers, that you're covering broader spectrum of, of football. Like, I've found my experience in journalism is that I can't think of any journalists working in Scottish football who... Obviously, lots of them support Celtic, lots of them support Rangers, and a fair few of them support neither of those teams. But I, I've never witnessed anyone go, I'm going to stick it to Celtic or I'm going to stick it to Rangers. Mm. People are just trying to get by. Like, it is a, it's an industry that is years since its heyday. You know, it is just, yeah. it tends to be just very stressed people trying to get through the day without yeah. pissing too many people off. That's my experience of sports journalism in Scotland. And there's lots of people doing good things and maybe some people who aren't doing good things, but no one's actively, as far as I'm seeing, and maybe I'm just naive, no one's actively pursuing an agenda against any one team because there just isn't, mm. there just isn't time to do that, you know, particularly at like kind of tabloid level. If there's a story that can be linked to, and this kind of comes back to the messy thing, if there's a story that can be linked to Celtic or Rangers, good or bad, it will go out. Yeah. So I saw a lot of people talking online about when Michael Beale got the Rangers job and there were a million stories in places like the record and the sun where it was Mick Beale says we're going to do this Mick Beale says we're going to do that and there were a lot of people on Twitter who were saying God they're building this guy up to be the next messiah eight stories <laughs> about him today and all that I'm like this is what happens every time Celtic yeah. Rangers mm -hmm. appoint a manager they will just find any story any possible angle and get as many stories as they can out in the day it's not a company line of the Daily Record or the Scottish Sun that Michael Beale is the messiah it's just People will click on this. People will read this because it's the Rangers manager and they want to hear what he's got to say. I just I think you could selectively pick 10 articles about Celtic or 10 articles at Rangers and claim that whatever outlet has an agenda. But really, it's just about the only agenda is getting people to read what you've got to read. And if you get Celtic or Rangers in the headline, they'll do it. I think we're all looking forward to the day very much where Mark McGee gets either the Rangers or Celtic job because the amount of headlines that will happen that day will just blow <laughs> blow a Scottish football Twitter into the stratosphere. Just as long as he doesn't get naked. I, I mean, I think we're all agreed on that, you know. Uh, Mark, Mark McGee naked certainly would not be good. I'm just thinking, how bad a job do you think Michael Beale's going to do that you're already talking about Mark <laughs> McGee? <laughs> just looking forward to next year. Adam, are, are there any specific avenues that you, you think might be worth keeping an eye on next year? Any particular managers? I think Lee Johnson at Hibs caught quite a few eyes this this season so far. With them, um, some of the things like that he said. Yeah, Lee Johnson seems to like a kind of unusual quote, and he had that thing where he got a, a sniper out training with them as well a few months ago. But yeah, I don't know how long he's going to last necessarily because they're on a pretty dodgy run just now, Hibs. So I don't know if he'll be around next year to keep entertaining people. But it's hard to, it's always hard to predict. Something will just creep up on you out, out of the blue. Thistle, Partick Thistle are always, there's always something going on there. It's funny, I was like, 
whenever uh, with with Partick Thistle, like whenever some traditionally made jokes about a certain type of Partick Thistle fan. Yeah, I was last night. I was out in the pub with a friend of mine from London who's up for Christmas, and he's a Partick Thistle fan. And genuinely, within about half an hour, he was talking to my mate about avocado toast and how best to prepare it. <laughs> and I, was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, the Partick Thistle fan has arrived. Well, that's all from us this week. My thanks to Adam Miller, a.k.a. Old Firm Facts, for joining us on the show. My thanks to Andrew as well for the pleasure of your company. And, of course, thank you to all of you out there for downloading and listening. From all of us here at the Scottish Football Show, have a wonderful Hogmanay and New Year. We'll see you all again very soon. Until then, take care. (laughs) 